Now it's time for RTB 101. This is the segment where we talk about practical questions to help equip you to share your faith with friends and family more effectively. And today I'm joined by my colleague and biochemist, Dr. Fuzz Rana. Welcome back, Fuzz. Krista. And we've been having some conversations about evolution. Mm -hmm. And I think that it would be really great to talk about the whole first life mm -hmm. question because mm -hmm. every biology, high school biology textbook in the country has the idea in it that the first life came from an ancient primordial soup. Right. So let's talk about that. That is looked at as being a critical evidence for biological evolution. Yeah, well, and this is a cornerstone idea in the evolutionary paradigm, but this is actually perhaps the Achilles heel for evolution is trying to explain the genesis of the very first life forms because uh, try as the scientific community might, they really don't have an explanation of how life came from non-life. So when we talk about the term evolution, the type of evolution we're talking about in particular right now, I think is chemical evolution. Chemical evolution, abiogenesis is another term. Okay. The origin of life is another term that you might hear used for that. And so our position about that here at Reasons to Believe is that we are skeptical. We're, we hold to some forms of evolution, right. uh, microevolution, right. but we're skeptical of chemical evolution. That's right, and the skepticism is well justified because the evidence is simply lacking for chemical evolution. So let's talk about that evidence. Going back to our high school biology yeah. textbook, one of the pivotal cornerstone ideas is the Miller-Urey experiment that I think back in the 50s or 60s, mm -hmm. there was kind of uh, an experiment where supposedly life was created, or yeah. that at least the conditions of life were right. replicated. Yeah, this experiment was done actually the early 50s. Okay. Stanley Miller was a graduate student in Harold Urey's lab, and Urey was a Nobel laureate. And Miller put together this glass apparatus with boiling water that was to simulate the early Earth's oceans, cleared out all the oxygen from the system, and then introduced a hydrogen and ammonia and methane, which he thought were the atmospheric conditions of Earth, had an electrical discharge that simulated lightning and was able to create amino acids in this experiment, which are building blocks for proteins, which are a very important life molecule. So he didn't create life, but he created building block materials for life. But people will point to this and say, this validates the idea of chemical evolution. So if you have just the right conditions, life supposedly seems very easy to be generated under these natural processes. Right, that's kind of the, the, the claim. But the interesting thing is... But there's some problems with that. <laughs> yes, uh, and that is that uh, the conditions that Miller used in the experiment are not the conditions that we now believe to be on the early Earth. So instead of hydrogen and, and ammonia and methane in the atmosphere, it was water vapor, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. And in that gas mix, the, the corresponding Miller-Urey experiment produces nothing at all. And so, in a sense, the Miller-Urey experiment is completely irrelevant to the origin of life question. So the conditions that they thought were there in the early Earth that they produced in that experiment, upon further investigation, digging a little deeper, right. oh, now we see the conditions were quite different, so we don't get the same results. Right. And this exemplifies the major problem with what's called prebiotic chemistry, is that while we may be able to go in the lab and make amino acids or the building blocks for DNA or for cell membranes, the problem is, is that the conditions that we use in the lab never ever translate to what the conditions would be like on the early Earth. Mm -hmm. And so no matter how we try to explain different steps in the origin of life, we see the same problem as confronts the Miller-Urey experiment. In other words, if it wasn't for the researchers who were intervening mm. to, to control the conditions, then these chemical reactions wouldn't happen. So in other words, intelligent agency seems to be critical to make uh, the origin of life happen. Oh, that's such a great point. So why do you think that this continues to be in so many high school textbooks, the Miller-Urey experiment. Well, I mean, it, the historical significance is one reason, and that's a legitimate reason to include the experiment in the textbooks, but 
there's such a deep commitment philosophically to the idea that life emerged through evolutionary processes that regardless of the failures of these experiments, uh, people are still convinced that it's just a hard problem and we'll figure it out one day. And so it's just a nice illustration of the concept of chemical evolution, though it really is irrelevant now uh, for, uh, the, for justifying chemical evolution. So if people want to dig deeper, where could they do that? Well, two books I would commend. Uh, one would be a book that I co-authored with Hugh Ross called Origins of Life. Another book is called Creating Life in the Lab that I wrote that kind of uh, goes into a lot of detail about the scientific issues with chemical evolution and why that same evidence actually points to a creator as being responsible for the origin of life. Very important conversation when we're talking to our non-Christian friends about the first life and kind of giving an explanation about our skepticism of yeah. chemical evolution. I've met a lot of people who are atheists because of the Miller-Urey experiment that they learned about in high school biology. Interesting, very good. And I also wanna encourage you to check out Fuzz's blog. It's called The Cell's Design. You can just go to our website at reasons.org and check out the latest scientific discoveries and how Fuzz connects those to the Christian faith.